If you've ever used any scientific equations, you know you usually have some values in the equations we call constants. These are just numbers that don't change that you need to solve the equation. So there are thousands of constants that we work with all the time in science, but there are only a few that we call fundamental constants. These are constants that are applicable to any system anywhere in the universe. They aren't some arbitrarily defined constant to solve a specific equation. There are about 26 of these constants. They include things like the speed of light, the rest mass of an electron, Planck's constant, the charge of an electron, the electric constant, and so on. But almost all of these 26 constants apply to specific particles like an electron or a quark or a photon, so they aren't universal to all particles in the universe. There are only three constants that are truly universal in their application to everywhere and everything in the universe. These constants are C, the speed of light, g the gravitational constant, and h Planck's constant. This is the constant that was most recently discovered during the discovery of quantum mechanics. It's the constant that sets the scale for all quantum events in the universe. The physicist Max Planck first used this constant when he was working on trying to solve the problem of how hot things emitted radiation. He couldn't get his equations to match experiments unless he only allowed the energy of the light to come in whole increments of a specific value. It was kind of a fudge factor that he just plugged in to make his equations work. To get the frequency to match the energy, it always had to be multiplied by this value of about 6.6 .6 times 10 to the negative 34 meters squared kilograms per second. He never thought there was anything special about this value. But it turns out it was the piece that made everything work. It was the value that tells us how on the small scale things aren't continuous, but they always come in lumps set at this scale. I can prove this to you by showing you some LEDs and how the energy always is a multiple of Planck's constant. LEDs emit light when an electron falls down from a higher energy state and emits light. So if I measure the energy it takes to light a specific color of LED and then divide it by the frequency of that LED, I should get a value that's close to Planck's constant. Okay, so first we're going to start with this red LED. So we know it's red, but we have to know the exact frequency of the LED. So I have here a little handheld spectrometer that you can look through and kind of see a scale of what the wavelength is here. Okay, so there's just this little hole here that collects light and then it gets diffracted and spread out on a scale that you can read. Normally you just look through it, but I have my phone peeking through it so we can actually record it and you can see what the values are. With a bunch of white light in the room, you can see just kind of the full rainbow on that scale here. So that 456 is 400, 500, and 600 nanometers. But if I bring my red light right behind here and shine it in there, you can see we get around 610 nanometers. Okay, now let's try our blue LED. That's around 440, 450 nanometers. You can see that bright spot right under where the scale is. Okay, now let's try our green LED. And our green one's right around 500, we'll say. Okay, now what I need to do is measure the threshold voltage of these LEDs. So that's the minimum voltage required to produce photons. So I'm just gonna estimate that by changing the voltage until I barely start to see some light. Okay, for the green light right here, we get around 2.1 volts. So for the blue light, I'm gonna go with around 2.5 volts. And now for the red light, we get around, around 1.7 volts. So we're gonna multiply this voltage by the charge of one electron. So 1 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs times this voltage will give us the energy. Then we just convert the wavelengths into frequencies. Then we take the energy for each color divided by the frequency of each color, and this is what we get for each color. If you look at all these numbers, you get almost the exact same number each time. If I average these out, I get 5.7 times 10 to the negative 34 joules per hertz. And guess what the real Planck's constant is? It's 6.6 .6 times 10 to the negative 34 joules per hertz. With just these crude instruments, we're almost to calculate almost exactly Planck's constant. This constant is used everywhere, in Schrodinger's equation to the uncertainty principle. It's really cool how we can easily rediscover a constant that's so fundamental to how the entire universe works. What's crazy to think about with these constants is how if they were slightly different, we wouldn't be here. For example, if Planck's constant were only 2.5% larger than its current value, then the size of atoms would also be larger. The radius of the Earth would increase by around 10%, and that would lead to a decrease in the gravity on the surface of the Earth by 20%. So that means we wouldn't be able to have any significant atmosphere that could support human life. 
The same goes for almost all of the other constants. If they were slightly different, then we wouldn't be here. If gravity was any stronger or weaker compared to the electric force, no stars or galaxies could form. If the stronger, weak nuclear forces or the masses of the quarks were only slightly different, atoms couldn't have formed. Every constant in the universe needs to be just what it is. There's no wiggle room. It's not like the universe would have just been slightly different if these values were different. It would be so different no life could have ever formed if you changed anything about it. This is known as the fine-tuned universe. One of the world's foremost particle physicists, Freeman Dyson, said, The more I examine the universe and study the details of its architecture, the more evidence I find that the universe in some sense knew we were coming. So at first it seems that the fine-tuned universe like ours could be used as evidence for a higher power creating it with the exact values it needs to exist. But the counter-argument to this is that if the universe exists with intelligent beings that can examine it, then that universe must be able to support that intelligent life, by definition. This is known as the anthropic principle. And that is that the range of possible observations that we can make about the universe is limited by the fact that the observations could only happen in a universe capable of developing intelligent life in the first place. But even with the anthropic principle, my question is why does it have to be so exact? Why couldn't there have been more options that could have supported life? It seems that there was one shot at having a universe that could support us, and here we are. And thanks again for watching another episode of The Action Lab. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you haven't yet. And thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.